Hey everybody, this is Chris DiFurio with Keys to the Shop. Welcome to another Rate of Rise episode. These are episodes that are focused on roasting and they are brought to you by Keys to the Shop. And I'm excited to present this conversation. These are elevated conversations on roasting. If you're not familiar with the series, I would encourage you to go to keystotheshop.com. Just search Rate of Rise or search roasting. You'll see all the past episodes of Rate of Rise. If you want to deep dive into the business and the craft of roasting, many of you out there are coffee retailers and roasters. These are very useful episodes with real heavy hitters in the industry. And I'm so uh, privileged and honored to have had them on the show to share their expertise. So you go to keystotheshop.com, look for that. Today, we're going to have an industry icon on the show to talk about uh, dealing with roasting and, and just embracing a variety of different uh, styles of coffees as a roaster and how to navigate that in a sensible way, how to become a roaster who can do dark, can do light, who can manage lots of different processes in coffee. It, it, there's so much to choose from. It can be overwhelming, but there is a, a, a way to focus in on the fundamentals. And that is the mantra of today's guest when it comes to teaching people to roast and uh, especially today's roaster that has all these tools at their disposal, uh, needing those foundations. We're talking to Willem Boot of Boot Coffee out in San Rafael, California. Uh, Willem started at the age of 14, basically. His family in Amsterdam, um, early on, they were in coffee. They uh, had a golden box coffee. It was a roasting machine that his dad had invented and they were coffee roasters. And he roasted his first batch of coffee at the age of 14. He ended up moving to the United States in 1998. And uh, when he did, he established Boot Coffee. And this is a consultancy, a place that trains people to roast, to taste, to learn about the intricacies of what goes on in the bean. And uh, you'll find that that's a theme throughout our conversation with Willem in this episode. Willem also runs a few farms in Panama and also uh, in Ethiopia. That's something that was able to be established uh, throughout the uh, 2000s, starting in 2006 in Panama. And in 2016, the uh, Boot Coffee Consulting established a campus. And that campus has hosted many people who have started their roasting journey on the right foot from the best in the business. And so today we're going to be talking to Willem about the uh, way to embrace the spectrum of different styles of roasting in your roastery. Uh, we do talk about processing methods and some of the controversy around co-fermentations or infusions specifically, and how we can make sure we're developing coffees well in concert with the unique processing methods that there are, as well as uh, attuning ourselves to taste our coffees um, as tasters and not just data collectors. Uh, we have so many tools at our disposal, and, and in this conversation, Willem does such a great job of uh, giving us a, a history of how things were, how they developed, and how they are now, and what are some advantages and disadvantages we have in the moment. And again, how do we focus ourselves as professionals to do a wonderful job with the variety of coffees and the variety of coffee tools that we have today? So this is a fantastic conversation. If you're a roaster who has a variety of different offerings for your guests, then you're not going to want to miss this one. So uh, without further ado, let's get right to it. Here now is our conversation on Rate of Rise with Willem Boot. All right, Willem, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm delighted to, to be here with you. Um, uh, I have been following you occasionally with your um, uh, podcast and you, you're doing a great job i think your role in this community of coffee enthusiasts um, coffee professionals uh, wannabe coffee professionals your role is very important to to drive forward the the education that people uh, and the knowledge that people seek uh, so oh, thank man. you for that uh, yeah, I, I, that means a lot coming from you, especially considering your history and influence in the industry. Um, it's one of these things where you have such a perspective on 
what it takes to not only succeed in the industry, but you've helped so many other people succeed in coffee and coffee roasting. And uh, I think today's conversation is especially important considering the uh, litany of choices we have to express our art and craft of roasting through varieties of coffee and styles of coffee and through boot coffee, you've been helping people do that and navigate best practices for a while. I'm wanting to start a little bit with the, the requisite, you know, how did Willem, I know you have a family history, um, the golden coffee box in Amsterdam, uh, you started at a very young age. But roasting was always the the thing that you were involved with. How did you uh, start to apply your trade in such a way that it was more more than just your craft, but it became something that you helped other people with theirs? Yeah. So um, when I was a teenager, my dad invested um, most of his livelihood in a project that he believed was going to um, change dramatically the coffee markets, the consumer markets, and he launched a coffee roasting machine, which basically was the golden coffee box. I have a, here in our lab, here in some, just north of San Francisco, I have a, a one of those golden coffee box machines out there. My dad was a perfectionist and he insisted on doing a very extensive stress tests with these machines before they were released in the market. And as a result, you know, this machine, every time I just turn it on, it just turns on. And it just roasts really well. So that was my first exposure to coffee roasting, which was a sample roaster size machine that my dad sold to uh, consumers, but also to professionals who wanted to be able to roast coffee in a in an easy way, in a simple way, um, with a good outcome. And so that was my first um, acquaintance with uh, coffee roasting. And then um, one, once my dad launched his coffee roasting retail business, I started roasting on a vintage, ger vintage German coffee roasting machine, uh, like a 12 kilo machine. And that's really um, helped me to yeah, connect to the craft of roasting, hmm. you know, and now I'm talking about this is, quite a few years ago, before there was any, any um, standard of um, measurement of temperature on coffee roasting machines. You know, occasionally machines had uh, an extra thermometer, but the, the first roaster that I started roasting on, that I learned roasting on from a more industrial, small industrial um, approach, uh, this machine only had one analog um, thermometer measuring the uh, temperature of the air just coming out of the machine. <laughs> and you would think, wow, well, how can you roast coffee that way? That's like, you know, driving a car with your eyes partially closed. Interestingly, you know, even with limited tools for measurement, you still have your, your time, of course, that you can keep track of. You have your senses, your, your smell, your sight, your hearing. And so if you don't have all those bells and whistles on a coffee roasting machine, there's a surprisingly number of um, ways in which instruments, partially sensory instruments, in which you can exactly gauge where you are in your roasting profile. Plus, my dad and I, um, after every roasting session, every roasting day, we would spend meticulous time to look at the color, to look at the shrinkage, the weight loss in roasting and, and weight loss and uh, roast um, development are very much uh, going in sync. So as a result of that, we were able to yeah, develop and maintain a really consistent um, uh, program of keeping consistent flavor profiles and to to be able to maximize, uh, optimize the, the development of the coffee in the roasting. And so if you look at that, where you look at you know, the 1980s and even until 
into the 1990s, roasting machines were very um, rudimentary uh, until um, manufacturers started to get the great idea to put digital thermometers on the machines and to have multiple measuring points. Um, and that's combined with the uh, technology that we see today, software technology, that allows you to make all kinds of analysis that of course creates um, uh, for the for the roast roaster operator the roast master that creates all kinds of uh, yeah techno te technically driven tools to do this job consistently and to hopefully optimize the flavor profile of the coffee and I'm saying hopefully because one uh, concern I have when I look at the current generation of roasters, you know, these are um, um, relatively young people, just like me when I started. Um, they are very much, I think, very much driven and attracted partially by this technology. But at the same time, and that's where my concern speaks, is that they are a little bit more um, uh, distanced from what's truly happening inside the bean during the roast development. Because the current generation of roasters tends to not necessarily look at the beans and smell the beans, but they tend to look at the graph, at the curve, at the ROR, the rate of uh, rise, at the um, uh, development percentage. You know, they have all those um, statistical tools, tools to their, um, they have them available, but are they really looking at the beans? Are they smelling the beans, looking at the color? So, so that's where I'm speaking some concern that I feel, you know, uh, roasters are becoming um, very much intertwined with the technology. To some degree, the, the technology drives their um, success of roasting, but not always are they looking at the intricacies, what happens in the bean. And, um, and I think it's important uh, we all here at Booth Coffee, we always emphasize that in our courses also, that we help students um, to focus on the fundamentals of what's going on with the beans itself, right? Because if the technology fails, if your um, data recorder or if your computer goes down, then you still need to be able to roast coffee. And you yeah. need to do that potentially without all the um, bells and whistles that are um, available. So. Uh, but it's been really fascinating to see the um, evolution of roasting technologies, how gradually um, drum roasters are becoming more sophisticated, to also see you have an influx of, um, of, of air roasters, roasters that use convection heat, preheated pre air. And it's really interesting to see how uh, these machines also as sample roasters, how they're kind of um, taking over uh, the market, it seems like, by storm. And um, and with that, we see, of course, coffees that are going through processes that were different before, anaerobic, and all kinds of variations on that theme. So it's it's very fascinating to see what's what's going on in this field. Um, and that's my, my introductory comment here at this um, podcast, and I know we only have 45 minutes, but we should have, you know, four and a half hours to talk about this. Um, um. Yes. No, I, I think that touches on so many different elements of the, the one question of, are we better off today with more options and more tools versus when we, and we're needing to develop our own innate sense which is undervalued in a lot of ways, uh, maybe more so than ever because of the tools, uh, not to demonize technology. And we, we work in a technology uh, dependent, like espresso machines and coffee machines and roasters. It's technology. And somebody long ago may have uh, laughed at the idea of a, of a convection drum roaster or a, a convection roaster or a, a drum roaster. And they said, why don't you just use a frying pan? Um, so if we're looking at, now a larger variety of processing methods and varieties of, of roast styles, even within the same roasting company, 
it feels like it's got to be harder to be a roaster today, even with the uh, number of instruments we have to use to bring us success because of the kind of choices, the, the availability of choice that we have now. Do you get a sense that people are a little bit more stressed out today approaching this than they may have been when it wasn't as overwhelming in the past? Um, you know, stressed out is probably not the right word. I understand what you're saying. There's a lot of, um, there are nowadays because of technology and because of the um, vastly increased variety in options of products, coffee products, um, there's probably more, much more opportunity to make errors, um, but there are more opportunities also to make the coffee shine, right? To make, to mm. create unique flavors. So I, I wouldn't say that as a result of that, the roaster community is more stressed out, but they're more, uh, I would say more tickled by the possibilities out there. Um, and it, it's, it's more, I think nowadays for a, a person, uh, man or female, and I want to just stress the importance of more women coming into this craft as well. I think nowadays for the um, roaster community, the community of coffee roaster operators, there's a much there's much more to to find, to gain, to learn than there used to be. Why is that? Because um, as a result of the great work of the Roasters Guild here in the U.S. and and in Europe to some degree as well, um, there is a lot of a lot more science that has come available to the community of uh, roasters um, and you know all, all the gatherings, the conventions of the SCA, the Specialty Coffee Association have helped with that, and, and all the courses that are being taught around the world in roasting really helps with that. Um, and also some of the, um, um, yeah, the, the great innovations that have been created by machine manufacturers all around the technology they, they incorporate. So, so there are more options out there. There's more to learn as a result of that, you might say, maybe there's more stress on the behalf of the, uh, roaster operator to keep up, but I. I wouldn't translate that as stress. I would, I would translate that as a, as, as motivating factors that can really, um, um, help, um, young folks to become intrigued by coffee, by the coffee roasting craft. And, uh, I find that really, um, uh, very positive to see. Um, and, you know, obviously, as I already mentioned, it has become more challenging, um, since there are so many more options to roast the same bean in different ways with radically different outcomes. So like right now I'm tasting a coffee that was roasted by my, by my colleague Valerian and um, he's been um, developing a new profile on a new machine that we just got in here. And we're comparing this profile to other options for different profiles on that same coffee. And that can make quite a radical difference. Now, if I look back at the old days, at the old days, there was not nearly as much focus um, spent on options for roasting profiles. Like, a, what is a roasting profile? A roasting profile is basically um, how you develop a coffee bean over a certain amount of time to a specific level of development. And there's different pathways possible. Now, in the old days, it seemed like simplified that there was just the pathway of bringing it to one color to another color in a certain amount of time. But nowadays there's so many different choices to be made. Uh, how much air do you want to introduce? Um, if your drum speed can be adjusted, um, you you have the option to do that. If you have a pressure, um, adjustment, as a, as a tool on your roaster, then that's, that's a great way to approach it as well. And then with all the new measurements, the relatively new me measurements, the rate of rise, the development percentage. So there's a lot of different, um, variables that can be tried out in the profile that you develop. 
So from that perspective, it has not become more stressful per se, but more uh, motivating, more enticing, more intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the demand for simplicity, or I would say focus, because you mentioned that as part of what you do, is to help people focus on the fundamentals that would translate across a variety of uh, methods that they end up landing on. Some people will use a uh, refurbished Gotthout roaster. Some people will use a Loring. Other people will use uh, Mill City or San Francisco. And it's it, their choice based on maybe their experience with that roaster across a, a variety of roasters that use that equipment, but once they have it, they have it. And most people are not going to have you know, three or four different types of roasters unless they run a roasting school. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you go about the process of focusing people on the fundamentals so that they can have success on that one roaster that they use across a variety of coffees uh, that they bring in to serve their guests. Yeah, so at our um, campus um, in San Rafael, California, we so we have different machine types using different technologies. One of them is the, the Gießen machine, which was um, made in uh, my home country. And so how do we go about teaching folks about roasting? I think first, the essential aspect is to bring home the message that a roasting roasting choice, um, a, the choice for a roasting profile with a certain coffee, is a um, is also a choice for a certain flavor profile, um, and that flavor profile, uh, obviously, once you start, once it comes um, to the point when you start brewing and presenting this coffee, then there is many different choices to make. But you know what's very important is that every choice for a roasting profile has a consequence of a distinct flavor profile. The question is always, you know, how can you optimize the flavor of that coffee? How can you make it shine right, in your roasting machine? And that's, that's where I think the um, uh, nuts and bolts partially lies with roasting is that you, with the bean you roast, that you first explore, yeah, what is the potential of this coffee bean once I get to develop my roasting profile. So where, what is the window of opportunities with this coffee? Um, if it's a coffee that has some unique fruit tones and maybe some subtle florin, uh, floral um, quality, so how can I um, approach my roasting profile in such a way that I maximize the fruits that I'm maximize the florals and that I bring it all in balance, in perspective. So, and that's um, a message we try to, um, when, when we train aspiring roasters, that's that's a message, message we drive, we try to drive home. Now, there's always a challenge is that when um, a roaster starts learning about uh, roasting profiles, then also it's very important that, that you, as a um, uh, aspiring roaster, that you develop your sense of uh, uh, your 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 sensitivity to the flavors and to the aromas, so that you develop your um, your sensory skills from that perspective. And mm. and sometimes it takes takes some encouragement for a um, aspiring roaster to recognize that they are potentially also great tasters, that they are potentially um, uh, masters in doing this, but they still need to unlock, unlock this uh, skill that they have not been able to uh, practice and develop yet. So that's, that's always a, um, uh, a fun challenge. Some students we we get uh, when we train them, we already have been tasting extensively. They have already been uh, exploring the development of their sensory abilities extensively. Uh, but yeah, I think it's always uh, it comes down to first um, exploring uh, with the coffees you present to the students that want to learn about roasting. First, you know, teaching our students, teaching them 
how to identify the window of opportunities with that coffee, how to optimize the flavor profile of that coffee. And I think yeah. ultimately, uh, when it comes down to roasting, it's really about that optimization, um, uh, being able to develop the, the recipe, the flavor profile, the roasting profile for doing that. So I think that's one yeah. of the key, the key uh, challenges here. So one of the things about tasting is that it's very personal, especially if you're, you get into the industry because you're, you fall in love with some aspect of a sensory experience. So becoming a professional in my mind is a matter of becoming a little bit more pragmatic and doing the work of being able to taste coffee across a variety of things, even that you don't love. If you love light roasted coffees, yet you ro roast coffees that are dark. It, there's there's this bias that you would have to overcome as a taster, and I imagine that's an impediment in some ways to a professional to have such a, a wide variety of, this is the coffee my customers love, it's a blend, it's darker. Um, then there's these nice uh, smaller run coffees that are lighter that we really love. How do we approach the variety of styles in a way that gives fair play to the expression of those coffees without shortchanging the things that we subconsciously don't don't really like and sometimes dare i say might just be ashamed of <laughs> we just have yeah. the money makers yeah so um if we look at you know where we are in in the us um in terms of roasting styles what we could say you know we're we're uh, recovering a little bit from um, a trend that started about 10 years ago, which was a trend to go into extremely light roast. Um, this obviously ha happened for a good reason, because for too many for too many years, too many companies had been, um, I would say, copycatting each other in terms of roasting very dark uh, French roasts and that phenomenon when it became popular in this part of the U.S. where I'm right now, which is the Pacific um, side of the U.S., uh, that kind of took over um, uh, the hearts of many consumers who started to discover specialty coffee. And then, you know, you saw 10 years ago, you saw this major reaction, an anti-reaction to roast very light. And now we are kind of in a um, phase where we are recovering from that. So we see now roasting styles um, that are not necessarily always super light, but you know that can be can be various. So as a roaster, how do you navigate in this field? If I would be a roaster now and I would be confronted with a certain percentage of my clientele or potential clientele looking for darker roasts, you know, I would be a fool not to give it to them, right? Because that would mean that I would say no to a good percentage of potential clients, but I can, in that process of um, engaging with these uh, consumers, these clients that seek out darker roasts, I can also gradually um, educate them, help them explore the benefit of a slightly lighter roast, of a roast that is not as um, dark and developed and smoky and whatever other uh, um, uh, ways you can describe the flavor profile. And, you know, obviously there's always a percentage of um, consumers that loves to be taken on a journey of uh, realigning themselves with the, the trends of maybe roasting a little bit milder, a little bit lighter. I think, you know, being um, document, dogmatic about it just for the purpose of defending the fact that you feel that dark roasts are bad, you know, I, I don't think that makes business sense. I think it, it always makes sense to help consumers, help your clients realign with different um, options that are out there. And, and that process, um, um, if you have a retail business, that process might be easier to accomplish because now you have a, um, a 
a platform where you face your clients daily, you can put out tastings. And if you have a business that's primarily uh, wholesale driven, it's a little bit more challenging, but, but still, you know, um, as an entrepreneur, as a roasting company, you always have the um, ability, the opportunity to re-educate your clients and gradually, you know, so, and I think um, that's, I see this happen, fortunately, um, a lot. If we see that the mainstream uh, companies that operate as specialty companies, that they are lightening up their roasts, then it means that they are already also recognizing that um, trends are shifting and that um, consumers are looking for, for different options. And um, I think that's fascinating. I, I think partially consumers have become uh, educated over the past 20 years in which we saw the um, evolution of the, the third wave of coffee. And um, it will be interesting to um, think about, you know, where this will lead us to um, in the next uh, 10 years and the next 20 years ahead. That's really interesting. And, you know, once they're educated, they have the choice to remain or to travel to another place on the uh, bean wall, if they will. They yeah. want to go to something lighter, but they might want to stick with the blend. They might want to stick with their uh, darker coffees. And that's fine. Um, they would just still expect us to give that dark coffee our, un you know, really the excellence treatment, the way we would do the light roasted coffee so that we can remain consistent and, and great. And the other element of this is the processing method of coffees, which I'm very interested to get your opinion on because, um, and, and this may not be happening, but there is a suspicion that I have. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm curious about what you think that with the, with the processing, some of the wild processing methods that we have, Sometimes it feels as though we are tasting coffee primarily for the processing method and not for the coffee itself, which is, I know, hard to discern between the two sometimes. But um, when people taste very fruity coffees, like a, a, just fruit bomb coffees, sometimes there's other parts of the coffees that might get missed or we call it a victory because we can taste a certain note in the coffee and the clarity gives us a sense of victory. Um, how can we make sure that we are roasting coffees very well in, in, and still we have these fruity coffees, but not letting the processing method cover up for potentially bad roasting practice? Yeah, yeah, that's, that, there's a fine line no? um, in, in that uh, perspective. So f first maybe about uh, the... Um, yeah, I, I would say, let's talk about the ethics of processing, right? Um, because there's a lot of um, um, criticism has emerged from the coffee community, from the professionals, that these um, really wild, extreme processing styles, that they kind of uh, bastardize the, the identity of the coffee. And and I think, to some degree, I agree. To some degree, I agree with that. So I I feel, if you are a coffee producer, and I'm a coffee producer, also I'm speaking here as a producer, um, and you're applying a processing style that completely changes, alters the flavor profile of that coffee, um, especially if you do this with um, what it's called infusion, where you infuse right. different um, ingredients, different products into your mass of coffee. I, yeah, you know, I I have a like an ethical problem with that, and the ethics is here that it's it's kind of um, to me if I taste coffees like these, it feels like you know you're tasting um, a um, a coffee that has been altered so much that I cannot taste the what they call the terroir in that coffee. It is completely taken over by by another influence, uh, which is in that case the the influence of the the ingredient used for infusion. 
and I, I have a problem with that because I feel that uh, ultimately um, to be able to, um, especially when we're talking about single origin coffees, where it's it's about the variety, the processing style, the um, skill of the producer, and a lot of those elements that define the um, the identity of the coffee. If you're going to alter that so much, then I just have a I have an ethical problem with that because I feel mm -hmm. that um, the the product itself um, just misses something fundamental, and that's the um, yeah, the, the 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 element of its uh, its true identity that is given to it by Mother Nature. Now this sounds very vague, and very uh, esoteric maybe, but I feel that um, um, a lot of producers should think twice before they apply processing styles which completely alter the identity, the flavor of their coffee to make it taste like something completely different. Now, if you take out the infused coffees and if we just look at processing styles, then I think um, processing styles, what they can do is that they can help the coffee make its case in the marketplace or make its case um, on the cupping table. And and if we look at all the options that are available here, um, then ultimately processing, in my opinion, serves you know two, two reasons. One is that you, uh, as a producer, create a coffee that is um, uh, yeah, expressing your skill and your philosophy as a producer and that can be you know you have producers that um, have developed uh, specializations in uh, washed coffees washed processing and they do this excellently uh, you have other producers who are who excel at um, natural processing styles um, and so that it can be an expression of their skill their specialization Processing style can also be an expression of you know where you are. Uh, if you are a producer in Yemen, it's very unlikely that you're going to do washed processing um, mm. because that style of processing um, will not only um, be difficult with the lack of available water, but it can also yield a result that is to consumers or to whoever is going to receive this coffee um, it could yield a result that is not recognizable for the profile of Yemen. I've never tasted yeah. worst coffee from Yemen, but it would be interesting to see a producer that, that is trying to, to do this. Um, and then, you know, when you look at the um, wave that we have had of um, anaerobic processed coffees, and um, so this is a a vast group of coffees where you allow the fermentation to continue um, where you're getting close to that point where you're going to seriously alter the flavor profile of the coffee. You know, some of those coffees are just wonderful in the way in which they can help you to uh, develop um, uh, a different quality of acidity. Um, Coffees that have more citric tones could be enhanced so that they are also develop some phosphoric qualities in the acidity. Now, that sounds very technical, but you know, that's a, a unique sensation that the acidity can create um, when you taste this coffee. And so I think what's the fascinating element of all these processing styles that have become uh, popular in the last um seven to eight years is that we've seen a new level of um consciousness a new level of specialization developing with producers um about the consequences that processing can have on flavor profiles and i find that very intriguing um i myself in our farm in uh, panama we have been uh, venturing very much into uh, processing approaches where we've been able to understand better on you know, what works best for the coffees we grow. We, we predominantly grow geishas, geisha coffees in Panama, and we have some um, 
Ethiopian, uh, originally Ethiopian heirloom varieties as well. And it's really wonderful to see uh, with these um, tools of processing how you can uh, optimize the flavor profile of these coffees. Uh, so with the roasting optimizing the flavor profiles, um, there comes a need to go beyond the identifiable character traits that say if it's a an acidity that you're looking for, there's more than just acidity in the coffee. As a taster of that roast uh, and you're cupping your roasts all the time, how do you how, how do we need to maintain a, a sense of awareness around a coffee that has a lot potentially overwhelming identifiable taste characteristics that unintentionally so might cover up other areas of the coffee that would hint at lack of development or un, you know overdevelopment but the the note is still there so if you're optimizing for the the method to taste the method and then that and you succeed in that is it possible that you've also potentially not roasted the coffee well i mean is and is that okay or how do we overcome that yeah i think the first step is for any roaster that wants to make this potentially into his or her uh, full-time profession or serious profession is invest some some money in a sample roaster and, and there is nowadays there there are a lot of choices out there for sample roasters but what a sample roaster allows you is um, to roast a small amount of coffee without the risk of um, uh, wasting a large quantity to develop a small amount of coffee in a uh, in different ways and so it's a tool that allows you not only to get to know the coffee itself but also to get to know what a roasting profile can potentially do to that coffee so that's and i feel this is a very important um, investment that any roaster out there should consider so once you have a sample roaster, then it gives you better ways to apply um, unique roasting profiles to your commercial roaster, to your to your shop roaster or your industrial roaster, and that's mm -hmm. I think very important because it becomes a tool for you know your own uh, research, for your own trials of how to better develop flavors in your roastery. And, and I feel that that is really key. And then also, um, while you're doing these sample roasts, and you can roast the same coffee in six minutes, or I can roast the same coffee in 15 minutes, and I can um, vary the roast time from six to 15 in many different ways. Then also, having some idea of you know what happens to the chemistry of that coffee during roasting right so when you come out of the drying phase and you go into these reactions which we call the Maillard reactions which is a very um, complex set of um, reactions that have a major influence on flavor so understanding what that can do to the coffee being roasted what can, what that can do to the flavor profiles is that, that that's you know very useful to know this and this is where a sample roaster can help you and benefit you a lot so using your sample roaster to um, kind of try to identify um, how to consistently develop that profile on a bigger machine that's where the value um, comes through of a sample roaster it's really a great tool to to do your trials, to do your research and your development. Yeah. Are there any tools and ro or roasting machines that are more optimal for certain processing methods and styles of roasting? You know, I think um, my personal conviction is that your roasting machine should be able to allow you to do both more um, uh, the application of uh, convection heat, which is the heat with preheated air, as well as with conductive heat, which is basically mm. heat that you um, uh, transfer to the beam through a preheated surface, which could be a drum. And so 
there are some roasting machines out there that give you the ability to do both very successfully. And, and I feel that those machines uh, are the more, yeah, the, univer the more universal machines for a roastery. Um, you know, one of those uh, examples, to give you some, some examples of machines that do this successfully, you know, are the, um, the older style of probat machines, which still um, enjoy a lot of popularity, the so-called UG machines. Uh, mm -hmm. There are uh, roaster operators that love them for that reason. But if you look at, you know, machines that are made new and that, that have been developed to that concept are the, the Gießen machines, which are made very close to where those other vintage probat machines have been made. But on the other side of the border, on the Dutch side of the border, and uh, Gießen has been kind of taking that um, uh, roasting uh, technology of the probat to the next level. And they have been very successful in incorporating this uh, aspect of uh, either convection heat, conductive heat, or using combinations of both. Hmm. But then I'm also thinking of, you know, um, machines like Loring, like IMF that have been coming up and that are um, very sought after for some of these same um, benefits. Yeah. But so I feel that uh, having a machine that offers you both convection heat as well as conductive heat gives you the, the best possible control on a wide range of options for profiling your coffee. Yeah, um, wide range of a, options for a yeah, wide range of coffee. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and then as a um, when you're trying to make a decision for what roasting machine to go with, you know, try to sit on the chair of an engineer, even if you're not an engineer. Think about you know what are the materials used. Um, how easy is it to control the profile? How to to adjust the heating, whether it's a um, gas burner or electric heating, which is nowadays becoming uh, more and more sought after. You know, the controllability and then the consistency aspects of how these machines operate, uh, very important as well. Well, I want to end here with the question of the next generation with all of these options and tools available to be successful at multiple levels in a variety of coffees, what would you say are the top, what's the top one or two things that you would really want to make a, a, a have people focus on as the next generation of roasting operations continue to scale and grow and influence the market? What makes the biggest difference in quality and success for roasters that you would really hope people focus on in the coming years? So I think the, the key is to always pursue um, and to know more about as a uh, aspiring roaster or as a roasting professional that um, yeah, unique link between what you do with your roasting machine, how you calibrate it, how you develop your profile, and what it does in flavor. Um, and so it sounds logic, right? That, that anything you do on your roaster impacts flavor, but getting that inherent knowledge and getting to know your roasting machine to the degree that you understand how choices on your roasting machine, how they impact flavor, that should be the top one priority from a learning objective for any roaster out there. And, um, and so, um, not necessarily always relying on your curves and on your numbers, but also making sure that it matches up in flavor profile. Um, that, that's, I feel, the, the nuts and bolts of roasting, that you are the chef in the kitchen where you are using your ingredients, you're using the right uh, tools, and now you want to make sure that your coffee tastes the way you had hoped it would and that it will be consistently done like that. So that that's I consider that the nuts and bolts. Um, and I always encourage all students coming to uh, our courses 
um, to to pursue that um, that wisdom how roasting impacts flavor and what options does your machine give you to develop new flavors from that same coffee hmm. sounds like a never-ending pursuit it this is a never-ending pursuit that's but it's, it's the holy grail of roasting i think yeah <laughs> It's the uh, golden box of roasting. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, Willem, thank you so much for taking time to chat today. Uh, you're right. We, there's so much to talk about here, and I'm glad we did get to cover some pretty important things. Um, tell us where we can stay in touch with all that you have going on through your, your various projects and uh, Boot Coffee. Yeah. So, obviously, at Boot Coffee, we... Um, have an ongoing calendar and program of courses that are uh, roasting courses, either um, um, accredited by the SCA or roasting courses that are just um, designed by our own team of um, roasting specialists. And um, these courses are always a lot of fun. And we have a good number of sensory courses whether they are from the um, SCA curriculum or from the Q curriculum, uh, which is accredited by the Coffee Quality Institute. And then we have a number of other courses, barista courses, um, courses that focus on the aspect of quality uh, management. Plus, um, we, of course, through my own involvement in coffee production, um, I have a, a growing number of students and um, yeah, folks who, who pursue the geisha coffees from Panama, where we, we started our um, farming. And um, so we are very, very much encouraging visitors to come to Panama to learn about, you know, the craft of production and processing and mm. um, producing coffees in that unique unique origin called Panama. So from that perspective, we're always um, here welcoming anyone who wants to um, pursue his or her knowledge uh, that way. Excellent. Willem, thank you for all your time and all you've done for the industry. And uh, we'll be seeing you around. I'll be seeing you in Chicago pretty soon. Yes, absolutely. And I wish anyone who is listening to this podcast um, success. Um, continue being curious about flavor and about the options to develop that and, and you'll be fine. And, and um, uh, always keep smiling. The, the passion in this craft is what, what has been driving me for the many past years. And I hope anyone that listens will um, feel the same way about uh, his or her passion in coffee. Thank you. 100%. Thanks, Willem. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. Well, I am really, again, just uh, thrilled to have had Willem on the show. If you are interested in learning more about what Boot Coffee does, of course, you can go to bootcoffee.com. Great place to go to be plugged into all of the different aspects of what Boot Coffee is involved with, uh, from the farms in Panama and Ethiopia to the campus and the courses offered there. And if you're also going to the SCA, show in Chicago. I know that Willem is going to be at the um, Panama booth serving up samples of Gesha coffees. And of course, Gesha coffee is, is one of those things that has been a focus of the farms that Willem has been in charge of running uh, for a while now. So that'll be fun if you get to experience that. Just look for him in the Panama hat. Uh, thank you so much to Willem for joining us. And if you have any questions or comments for me about today's episode, feel free to reach out. Chris, at keys to the shop.com. That's where you can uh, give me all the questions and feedback about today's episode and any other episode of keys to the shop. And if you're interested in working with keys to the shop consulting for your coffee shop uh, and coaching for your cafe, that's again, the place to reach out Chris at keys to the shop.com. And uh, with that, that is the end of our rate of rise episode for this month, the month of April. And uh, always glad for all of you joining me on these uh, episodes. So uh, stay tuned for more content coming out, especially on our YouTube channel at Keys to the Shop. More content means uh, unique content on the YouTube channel to help you build a wonderful, thriving coffee shop that is a people 
first business through roasting, through uh, the cafe, and just good coffee with good people. So thanks, everyone. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>